Good morning and welcome to worship on this first day of August. I hope that you have grabbed your Bible and prepared yourself for this time together with us. Light a candle, get ready as we open up scripture from Matthew 5. We continue our sermon series and we'll be talking about the difference between letter, letter of the law to spirit of the law. So prepare your hearts now as we go to, to the Lord in worship. a real scorcher today. Uh, do you guys know the best way to keep cool when it's this hot? Yes, you're correct. Water is extremely important. And yes, staying inside in the air conditioning helps as well. But what is the best tasting way to stay cool? Ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. Ice cream is my number one favorite treat to eat when it's hot outside. But <laughs> I've got a problem. I've got 12 delicious looking ice cream cones here. The problem is only six are actually delicious. You see, two of them are chocolate, my favorite. Two of them are vanilla, tasty. And two of them are strawberry, <laughs> also yummy. There are also two liver flavored cones. Ew, two ranch dressing flavored cones, <laughs> yuck. And two salmon flavored cones, gross. Why is that even a thing? Anyway. I need your help to sort them out. I've got some Bible trivia questions here, and the answers are gonna be written on the good tasting ice cream cones. The super gross cones, however, will have wrong answers written on them. So if you can get the answers right, we can find all six tasty ice cream cones. If not, I may end up taking a big bite of salmon ice cream. <laughs> Yuck. Think you can help me out? Oh, great. Here's the first question. What is the first book in the New Testament? Matthew or Mark? Shout out the answer if you know what it is. Okay, time's up. Matthew is the correct answer. We found one of the delicious chocolate cones and got rid of one of the gross liver-flavored cones. Ew, great work, everyone. Let's try another. Who was given a coat of many colors in the book of Genesis? Noah or Joseph? Shout out the answer if you know it. Who said Joseph? You're correct. Nice job. Two down, four to go. Who marched around the city of Jericho seven times? Samuel or Joshua? Shout out the answer if you know it. Time's up. Joshua is the correct answer. Well done. You found one of each flavor now. Only three questions left. Who was king of Israel before David? Saul or Samson? Shout out the answer if you know who it is. Okay, time's up. Who got it right and said Saul? Great job! You found the other delicious chocolate ice cream cone. All right, you've only got two cones left to find. Which of these books of the Bible tells about when Jesus was born? Luke or Job? Shout out the answer if you know it.
Okay, time's up. The correct answer is Luke. Well done, everybody. There's just one more strawberry cone we need to figure out. Which of these women became a queen? Ruth or Esther? Shout out the answer if you know who it is. Okay, time's up. The correct answer is Esther. Nice work. You found all of the good ice cream cones. Thanks for helping me with that. Now, if you'll excuse me, someone needs to eat these cones before they melt.
Hello, I'm Jeff Curley, and I want to share with you a capital campaign proposal for St. Luke's Church. The theme of our campaign is building a better place to bring our neighbors together for worship, for our children, and for our future. For the next few minutes, the staff and the capital campaign committee will describe that better place and ask you to just imagine. Let me start by answering the most obvious questions. What is a capital campaign and why do we need one? A capital campaign by definition is an intense effort on the part of a nonprofit organization to raise significant dollars for a specific project or projects and the fundraising efforts ends when the projects are completed and paid for. For many of us, when we want to make a large purchase such as a new house, a new car, or a major home improvement, we can't just write a check from our everyday bank account to pay for it. We take out a loan to finance the purchases and pledge to pay it back over time. Why do we need a capital campaign? Major projects at our church are similar and that we can't pay for them out of every day or every year ministry operating funds. We look for an upfront commitment on the part of the congregation with a collective pledge to pay for the project over time. Of course, the church and our ministries need to continue to operate as normal during the capital campaign. So we ask members to pledge and contribute over the above and the normal tithes and offerings in order to meet the capital project goals. The capital campaign committee has been meeting over the past two years. The proposal is that the church raise $900,000 over the next five years to pay for several specific projects. Jeff will give you more of the details. The capital campaign proposal includes funding for new audio and video equipment in the main sanctuary and the Family Life Center, new lighting in the main sanctuary, and a modern security camera system, and a state-of-the-art Bluetooth hearing system. It also includes major renovation of the children's building. We would update the halls, bathrooms, and doors, and change the layout to improve security and visibility. We would add two offices, a family room, and a multi-purpose room, all within the current building footprint. And we would modernize the kitchen. Just imagine how these changes will enable us to bring together children, parents, families, and teachers, and position St. Luke's to address childcare needs of the congregation and the community. In the Methodist Church, there's a defined process for a congregation to initiate a capital campaign. Once the proposal has been developed by a committee and recommended by the Administrative Council, it must be formally approved by the congregation as a whole. This is done through a church conference in which all full members of the church have a vote. Our conference will be on Sunday, August 8th. If 80% or more of the votes cast are in favor of the campaign, it will officially begin. Our campaign goal would be to raise $900,000 through both upfront donations and pledges. Pledge donations may be made at future lump sums or at regular intervals, such as weekly, monthly, quarterly, or yearly over the period of five years or less. Once we achieve a giving and pledge goal of 75% of the total, we would begin the various projects. The audio video technology improvements would come first because the material and the labor for the projects are readily available. The renovation of the children's building would follow as the process is much longer and includes solicitation of bids, evaluation of proposals, and the actual construction and renovation. In summary, the Capital Campaign Committee has recommended that the congregation approve a capital campaign for a total of $900,000 over the next five years. For each member of the congregation, we ask you to participate in the church conference on August 8th and cast your vote to approve the campaign. If the campaign is approved, then we ask you to support St. Luke's by pledging and giving according to your own ability. In our ever-changing world, we have seen how important it is for us to use technologies to stay connected to our congregation and our community. We know how important it is to offer modern and engaging ministries for our children, our youth, and our young parents. 
This campaign is not about today. It's not even about all of us. This campaign is about the future of St. Luke's and the growth of the next generation. Just imagine how together we can build the vibrant St. Luke's of tomorrow for ourselves, for our children, for our community, and for the future to come. This morning, as we go to the Lord in prayer, I ask you a question. Are you living according to what scripture says? Are we really trying to refrain our life and um, be holy in God's eyes? And that's a question for all of us as we seek to live in discipleship and grow in faith. So in order for us to do that, it takes some personal reflection. So as we look at um, the scripture today and we go to the Lord in prayer, I encourage you to do some self-reflection and I'm going to be presenting in our prayer Psalm 101 this morning. So let's pray and go to God in prayer. gracious and loving God, we come to you in prayer this morning, doing some self-reflection um, of our own lives. God, seeking to grow in your presence, grow in your grace, grow in your image. Lord, for you to refine our lives so that we might live obediently and holy. And so, Lord, we offer a psalm back to you that you have given to us as a prayer this morning. Lord, help us to praise you for your loyalty and your justice in the world. You are the beloved, and we sing to you, O oh God, to hear our prayers. Give heed to the way that leads us to peace, making our home in our hearts for you. You are our loving companion and friend. So God, we pray that we might walk with integrity wherever we go, that we might see you in all of creation, that we might be a mirror of your love to all that we meet, that we might reflect the freedom of your truth and live as beneficial presence in the world. Forgive us, O oh merciful one. Forgive us if we turn from those in need. Humble us, O oh God. Keep us from arrogance and greed. Help us to embrace you and your presence around us and within us. Lord, you say that you accompany us, those who love you, that we might grow in wisdom. So God, we pray that we walk with you and continue to walk on the path that you have lit for us, that you have given us word to do. And Lord, also, we pray that you'll give us wisdom through that. Help us to be silent when we need to be silent and lean into your eternal light and listen for your gentle voice. Lord, help us to not oppress one another because you call us all children of God. Keep us in company with one another. Help us dwell in the house of love. Lord, we know that no one seeks to live in darkness, but God, it happens. Help us to walk in the glory of your light. And Lord, we offer ourselves to you in great surrender. 
that it is you we trust. It is you that we put our foundation and hope in. It is you that we walk in light of, that we seek, that we yearn for. Lord, help us to have grateful hearts this day and radiate your peace in the world. Lord, we offer ourselves to you this day. Our hearts, our minds, and our souls. We give it all to you. And we say, here I am, Lord. Use me, shape me, and fill me with your presence. And we pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, good morning. Today we continue our Summer on the Mount series, looking into Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And today he's going to teach us about living by the spirit of the law, the, the Old Testament law, that is. And so I want to begin by saying that I'm not a Trekkie by any means, but you remember Star Trek, particularly the, the TV series. Some of you don't, many of you do. But the crew of the Starship Enterprise were on a five-year mission to do what? To boldly go where no one has gone before. And essentially in the Sermon on the Mount, that's what Jesus is teaching us to do. Uh, and in this section, he's teaching us in one particular way to go in our walk, in our faith, and in our practice as Christians to go where we may have never gone before. It's a real challenge, so let's look at it today. So the Lord in this section leads us to, again, go beyond, to live beyond that strict and that mere letter of the law. So I want to lay out um, what, what living by the letter of the law looked like in Jesus' day. And I want to introduce it by asking a question. Um, have you ever heard a comparison between the four major types of government by using two cows? Probably not. So it goes basically something like this. Socialism would, give, would have you to give one of your cows to your neighbor and keep the other. All right? And then communism would insist that you give both cows to the state and occasionally you might be fortunate enough to get back some milk and butter in return. Nazism may even just shoot you and take both of your cows. Capitalism would have you keep your cow and also buy a bull to produce more cows and more bulls. Now, leading into today's text, I want us to add one more ism, and that's legalism. Now, under legalism, Legalism would lay down so many nitpicky rules and regulations concerning keeping cows that nobody would even want cows anyway. So legalism is burdensome, and it's characterized by the Pharisees, the religious leaders in Jesus' day and time, and the very, what we call the epicenter of, of their legalism were these ridiculous rules concerning the keeping of the Sabbath, okay? So let's just check out a few 
to give a flavor of what Jesus was facing in the day, uh, just from the Pharisees' do not list. All right, here's a few. Do not bake or make two loops or weave two threads or separate two threads or sew stitches or tie or untie or write two or more letters or erase two or more letters or build a fire or put out a fire or put the finishing touch on an object or I like this one it's really peculiar or transport an object over 18 inches unbelievable if you think about it can you imagine just imagine trying to adhere to these and so many more nitpicky rules every Sabbath day. Where's the joy? It's been stolen, right, by legalism. <clears throat> but these religious leaders have become so blind to the intended purpose of God's laws. And what were the intended purpose of God's laws combined? To help people, to lead people in loving God with all their hearts and all their minds and loving their neighbors as themselves. In Jesus' day, these, these religious leaders, they were just, they, they were piling on these burdensome rules, forcing God's people back then to live by their application of the strict letter of the law. And so that's just a brief background to lead us into to Jesus' motivation maybe for, for teaching in this way about the letter of the law and what he's emphasizing here. So as Jesus faces this religious mindset in his day and time, he challenges God's people to, again, quote, go beyond where they have, may have ever gone before in their lives. And he challenges us today in the same way. And that's in matters of faith and practice. In matters of faith and practice, what we believe and how we practice our faith to go beyond where we may have ever gone before. In other words, to, to live past the Pharisees' letter of the law and to begin living by the spirit of the law, the spirit of the law. You know, 600 years before uh, Jesus' time, the prophet Jeremiah foretold of living by this more internal spirit of the law. He writes it this way. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. 600 years before Jesus. Jesus begins this section of the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 17. I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets. In other words, the Old Testament as we know it. But to fulfill the law and the prophets. Think about it like this. You know, the Old Testament is like the gospel in the bud. And the New Testament is like the gospel in full bloom. And so rather than annulling the Old Testament law, Jesus reveals the full depth of its meaning. He does not abolish it. He fulfills it. Let's, after all, let's keep in mind that the Old Testament back here points to Jesus, right? You know, his, by his life, by his teachings, by his death, by his resurrection, he completes God's plan that began back in the Old Testament. And remember, the Pharisees just passionately lived by, by their desire to keep the Old Testament laws and by adding their own stricter interpretation of him. So get what Jesus says in verse 20 in the text we heard today. Now, at first glance, this makes me really squirm. So we need to, we need to understand what he's saying here. Because he says, unless you do far better than the Pharisees in matters of right living, then you won't know the first thing about entering the kingdom. What, when Jesus' followers heard this, they did what some or maybe many of us are doing right now, shaking their heads, saying, ain't no way we're going to be able to keep the Old Testament law as strictly as the Pharisees kept it. But you know, thankfully, the Lord does not ask us to do this. As Christians, then, the question is, 
what does the Old Testament law have to do with our lives here and now? So we need to grasp hold of the fact that Jesus is not making the point that we're to have more right living than the Pharisees, but we are to have more in our right living than the Pharisees. So let's look at it this way. Christian right living supersedes the right living of the Pharisees long ago. And why is that? Because Christian right living goes deeper, so much deeper than, than that. Uh, Christian right living is not merely an external letter of the law adherence. Christian right living is an internal spirit of the law adherence, involving not just what we do on the exterior, but how we think and the attitudes that we carry within ourselves. So Jesus' way goes much deeper. You know, very helpfully in this section, Jesus gives us six different illustrations to, to show us how to more deeply live by God's Old Testament laws. And he begins each one something pretty much like this. You've heard that it was said, but I say to you. You've heard that it was said, but I say to you. Whenever Jesus quoted the Old Testament, this is, this is significant. He usually said, it stands written. Meaning, the scripture says. But, in, it's significant that in each of these six illustrations that he gives us, he states it differently. Not, it stands written. Meaning, the scripture says. But, you've heard that it was said. So, he does not state, the scripture says, but I say. He does state, your tradition states, but I say. Huge difference. Huge. And so let's look at three of these six illustrations, because we only have time to do three. Um, as Jesus takes us past this living by the letter of the law to living by the spirit of the law. So in, in verses 21 through 26, we hear one illustration uh, that he gives of living by the letter, or by the spirit of the law, the spirit of the law. So first Jesus shares, in each one he shares the letter of the law. The letter of the law in this first illustration states this, you've heard it said, do not murder. You've heard it said, you must not murder. Well, the teachers of the day thought that if their students just stayed away from the act of murder itself, if they just avoided the act of murder in and of itself, then they had kept the sixth commandment, do not kill. But now Jesus offers the spirit of that law when he says, but I say, if you are angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. And to help us grasp this, he, he gives uh, a very common example uh, that, that's been helpful for so many people. Basically, he says, you know, if you're in the middle of a worship service, let's say, and suddenly remember that someone has something against you or that you're holding something against someone else, then just leave worship immediately. Go make things right with that person. Don't even wait till the service has ended. First go and be reconciled to that person. And then come and offer your worship to God. So Jesus leads us deeper into this law. You must not murder. Past that act of murder to our thoughts and our attitudes and the feelings that we carry within us. He takes us deeper into that law, right? All right. Now, in verses 27 through 30, he gives us a second illustration of living by the spirit of the law. First, Jesus again shares the letter of the law. You've heard it said, be faithful in marriage. Again, the teachers 
thought that if their students just stayed away from the act of adultery, that they had kept the seventh commandment. Do not commit adultery. And now Jesus sets forth in this pattern that he uses here, he sets forth the spirit of the law once again when he says, but I tell you that if you look at another woman and want her, you're already unfaithful in your thoughts. He's taking us deeper. And Jesus uses a hyperbole for, um, as an attention getter. He, listen to the hyperbole he gives. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, then just poke it out and throw it away. Or if your right hand causes you to sin, then just chop it off. Throw it away. You know, when I, for a few months between college and seminary, I took a year off and I worked at uh, what then was Charlotte Memorial Hospital. Now it's Carolina Medical Center. We now call it CMC. One of the patients I worked with in the psychiatric unit there uh, had actually, uh, was, was blind in one eye because he had literally tried to gouge out his eye with his finger because he took these words of Jesus strictly by the letter of the law. Hmm. So what's the spirit of the law that Jesus is getting at here in this? Simply, you know, if, if our eyes, things that we see, cause us to sin, then, then don't look there, right? Now, if, if our feet, places we go, cause us to sin, don't go there. If our hands, things we do, cause us to sin, then don't touch it. That's living by the spirit of the law in this instance. And one more, verses 38 to 42, we hear that third, a third illustration out of the six of Jesus gives living by the spirit of the law. Again, he states the letter of the law at the beginning. You've heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. We've probably quoted that one many times in our lifetimes. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But this letter, this letter of the law was given to limit retaliation on the part of, of people. Uh, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and it means and no more than that. Uh, you know, if somebody punches you in the face, you don't stab them or shoot them. It's eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and no more. That's the letter. And you know, it was necessary because sometimes, hey, believe it or not, people can be prone to overreacting <laughs> I mean, they can be prone to over-retaliating, right? And by the way, this scene I'm about to share made it all the way to the blockbuster film in Hollywood years ago, Smokey and the Bandit, starring Burt Reynolds and Sally Field. Uh, this is the true story. It is based on a true story, this scene in the movie was. Because late one summer evening in Broken Bow, Nebraska, this weary truck driver pulled into an all-night truck stop, and just as he got his food, this uh, tough motorcycle gang, several members of it anyway, walked into the diner and they walked over to this truck driver and started giving him a hard time. One stole his hamburger, another grabbed a handful of french fries, another took his cup of coffee and started drinking it. So what did he do? He calmly stood up, paid his check and he left. And the waitress watched him as he drove away. And when she came back into the dining area, one of the cyclists made the comment, said, not much of a man, is he? And she said, well, I don't know about that, but he sure isn't much of a truck driver because on his way out of the parking lot, he just flattened three motorcycles. <laughs> and, you know, in our initial reaction, isn't it prone to being like, yes, you know, uh, when I saw my, the movie, that's kind of what I did. Yes, you know, you know, don't get mad, get even. But again, we hear Jesus insisting that we live by the spirit of the law. No more of this tit for tat, eye for eye, tooth for tooth mentality on our parts. He's saying live the way God lives toward you. Live generously and graciously toward others. 
So, again, we go back to the beginning. Remember that the mission of the Starship Enterprise was to go beyond, to go beyond. And this section on the Sermon on the Mount stretches us. It really does stretch us to do the same, to go beyond living by the mere letter of the law and to live our lives instead by the spirit of the law. In other words, for us to boldly go in matters of faith and practice where we may have never gone before. As we go forth to live our lives this week, seeking to follow Jesus each day, may the Lord go in front of us to give us guidance and direction in life, behind us to keep us from stumbling and falling, beside us to be our constant companion and our friend, and within us to give us that peace that surpasses all understanding. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.